how do we do natural deduction proofs in first order logic? It's kind of simple. First of all, we learn natural deduction for propositional logic, and then we add four extra rules for the quantifiers. So let me show you what they are. Hello everyone, welcome to Attic Philosophy. This is a series of videos on introducing the basic concepts of logic. At the moment, we are looking at how to do natural deduction proofs. In the previous video, I showed you how to do natural deduction proofs in propositional logic. In this video, we're going to extend that to first order logic. So make sure you've already watched the videos on propositional logic because we're going to be building on that. And in this video, we're just extending what we learned there by looking at the rules for first order logic. And then in the next video, I'm going to take you through how we use those rules in natural deduction proofs. If you're finding this series of videos useful, why not subscribe to the channel and get the updates? The good news when we come to natural deduction in first order logic is that all of the rules that we learnt for propositional logic still stand. So we can still use all of those rules. All we need to do to build it up to first order logic is add rules for the quantifiers, okay? We've got two quantifiers, the existential and the universal quantifier. So we're gonna need four rules, an introduction and an elimination rule for each of those quantifiers. Two of those rules are really straightforward. Two of them are a little bit tricky and we're gonna have to build up to them. So let's start with the simple rules and then we'll get to the tricky ones. So perhaps the simplest rule is universal elimination. Here's a really simple and obviously valid inference. If everyone's happy, then I'm happy. Something like this. From all x, fx, we can conclude fa. And that goes for any name. So from everyone's happy, we can conclude I'm happy and we can conclude you're happy and so on. The general form of this rule here looks like this. This is going to be the rule for universal elimination. Let me just explain exactly what the notation here means. Here we've got some sentence A that's got in it some instances of X as a free variable. OK, so bound by the quantifier at the front. So this is referring to any universally quantified sentence A that's got some occurrences of X in it. This is exactly that same sentence with all the X's replaced by this name C. OK, so C is a name, X is a variable. To go from here to here, we get rid of the universal quantifier and we replace all of the X's that were bound by this quantifier with any name C that we like. So we can keep repeating this rule with different names. So that's a really, really simple rule. Next rule, existential introduction. This one goes like this. From I'm happy, we can infer that someone is happy. OK, so from FA, we can infer there is an X, FX. So from any sentence A with some occurrences of a name C in it, we can infer that there is an X such that A. Now notice here, we don't need to replace all instances of C with X, where the X is bound by this quantifier. We can replace all of them, but we don't have to. We might just replace some of them. So what we're saying in this notation is replace some or all of the C's with X's. Why is it that we're allowed to replace just some of them? Because we can reason like this, OK? Suppose that Anna likes herself, R-A-A. From that, we can infer, sure, we can infer that someone likes themselves, but we can also infer that Anna likes someone, and we can also infer that someone likes Anna, and we can also infer in two steps that someone likes someone. So there is an X, there is a Y, X likes Y. We should be able to infer all of these things from the fact that Anna likes herself. So to make room for that, we have to allow us to replace just some of the A's here. OK, so in this one, we've replaced both of them. But in this one, we've replaced just the second A. In this one, we've replaced just the first A. And here, we've done that in two steps. So from R-A-A -A to 
there is a Y, R, A, Y, and from there to there is an X, there is a Y, R, X, Y. One thing we do have to be careful of when applying this rule, existential introduction, is that X, the variable that we're introducing, isn't already in A as a free variable. Why is that important? Well, suppose there was an X in here somewhere. Then when we slap this existential quantifier, there is an X at the front of the sentence. It would bind the X that was free in here. So we would start off with an open sentence and end up with a closed sentence. OK, and that wouldn't be a valid inference. So we just have to be a little bit careful there. Whenever we use existential introduction, whatever quantifier we use, there is an X. We have to make sure the X isn't already in A. OK, now let's move on to the tricky two rules. Let's start with universal introduction. So we're trying to introduce something of the form for all X A into our proof. OK, now conceptually, this is a tricky thing to do, because how could we prove that everything is a certain way? It's not going to be enough to go through every instant because we can't fit all of them into a proof, right? So we're going to need a cleverer way of doing it. So let's think about some forms of reasoning involving everything that seem to be perfectly good inferences. Suppose we start off by assuming that A is F. And from that, we infer either A is F or A is G. Well, from that, we can conclude from arrow introduction that if A is F, then it's F or G. OK, that's good reasoning. And from that, we can conclude that everything is such that if it's F, then it's F or G. Now, that seems like a good bit of reasoning. And in fact, it is a good bit of reasoning. But now let's have a look at something that looks quite similar that's going to be bad reasoning. Suppose we start off with a premise that A is F. And then we assume further that A is also G. So we can conclude from that that A is both F and G. And then by arrow introduction, we assume this, we concluded this, so we can infer if A is G, then A is F or G. Now, suppose we try to make the same move that we made here, inferring that this line applies to everything. Everything is such that if it's G, then it's F or and G. OK, that's obviously not correct. Just because something is G doesn't mean that it's both F and G in general. This first bit of reasoning's good. The second bit of reasoning's bad. But what's the difference? So the difference is the way that the name A is used in these two proofs. In this proof, the bad proof, we had some information about A. We then assumed something further about A, inferred some stuff, and then conclude that everything is like that. Well, that just doesn't follow because our premise was about a specific A and we can't generalize from a specific thing to a general fact, okay? This might be that I'm happy, but we can't go from me being happy to everyone is such that if you're tall, then you're happy, okay? So in this one, we had some specific information about this person A. So suppose F A is I'm happy. We would then be saying from I'm happy to if I'm tall, then I'm both happy and tall. That's true. And then concluding that everyone is such that if they're tall, then they're happy and tall. It's not true. And the problem there is this is specific information about someone like me. OK, and you can't go from having specific information about someone to inferring it applies to everyone. In this proof, on the other hand, we don't start off with specific information about anyone. Kind of here, we start off with nothing, but we make an assumption and we start by assuming something about this random person A. Now, who is A here? Well, they don't appear in the proof before. So they are an arbitrary person, an arbitrary individual. A here is an arbitrary name. It doesn't appear in the proof up to this point. 
So in this case, this is the very beginning of the proof, but if there was other bits of the proof up here, let's just suppose that A doesn't appear in any of those. Then this would still be a good bit of reasoning. The reason this would still be a good bit of reasoning is because we haven't got any prior information about this individual A. OK, so to say that they are arbitrary or that A is an arbitrary name means we have no prior information about A. So we just make up this person. We just make up this individual A by assuming that they're, for instance, happy, infer from that that they're happy or tall and then conclude that if they're happy, then they're happy or tall. And because that isn't a specific individual, it's an arbitrary individual, we can infer that everyone's like that. OK, so this is the key point about how we do universal introduction. We first of all show it's the case for an arbitrary individual, and then we assume it's like that for everyone. So to infer for all x something, we have to show the something holds of an arbitrary individual. And that basically means we start off an assumption involving an arbitrary individual, an arbitrary name, one that hasn't appeared in the proof before. OK, technically it can appear in the proof before. The exact criteria is it can't appear in any undischarged assumption or premise. So it's like we can use that as an arbitrary name in a previous proof. We can then discharge that proof. So any part of the proof that this is in the scope of, you can't have an A in it. This has to be the first occurrence of A within that scope. But that's a kind of technicality. To keep it simple, just treat A here as a brand new name. If you use a brand new name, it will act as an arbitrary name and you'll be able to safely infer the universal quantifier. So the general form of that rule is this, universal introduction. If you can infer that A holds of an arbitrary name C, then you can infer from that that it holds of everything. OK, so C here has to be arbitrary. That means not included in any undischarged assumption. And also, like in the last case, the X that we pick here can't already occur up here. If it did, it would be a free variable here, but a bound variable there. OK, final rule for us to look at, existential elimination. Now, this one is also tricky because suppose we know that something is F, so somebody is happy, but you don't know who it is. So, I, you know, I can't infer that it's me. I can't infer that it's you. How do we use this information to do stuff in our proof? Suppose you also know of everyone that if they're F, then something else. OK, so suppose you know that of everyone, if they're F, then Bob is rich then you can infer Bob is rich. You can infer GB or whatever this is here. That's perfectly good reasoning. In fact, we can already demonstrate that this is good reasoning because think about this sentence here. It's in pre-next normal form. And think about what sentence we might have got that isn't in pre-next normal form, but that would have got us to this sentence by putting it in pre-next normal form. By the way, if you don't know what I mean by pre-next normal form, Go back to the videos on first order logic where it's all explained. So the sentence that would give us this one when we transform it into pre-next normal form would be if something is F, then B is G. OK, and then a straightforward application of modus ponens would get us from that sentence and this premise to this conclusion. So that's why this is straightforwardly valid. Now think about how we might derive this sentence here. OK, this universal sentence, we would have to use universal introduction. How would we do that? Well, like the way we just did a minute ago. So we would start with this and then we would assume F.A., try to derive GB. Don't know how we'd do that, but let's suppose we can for some reason. Then we can infer GB. OK, so here we're just replacing this line with this bit of reasoning, the kind of reasoning that we would do to infer this. And for that to be good reasoning, we would have to make sure that A here is an arbitrary name. That's what we have to use to be able to infer a universally quantified sentence. This pattern of reasoning here gives us the form we're going to use for existential elimination. If we start off with the information that something is F and then we assume 
the A is F. So this is an arbitrary name. So we take this arbitrary thing, A to be F. Then whatever we can infer from that, we can infer from this provided that we don't cheat. And cheating in this context would mean getting information about this arbitrary individual into our conclusion. So the conclusion that we draw here can't be information about the arbitrary individual that we introduce here. OK, if we could do that, we could cheat like this. We could go, oh, F.A. here, so F.A. here, so F.A. here. That would allow us to infer from there is an X F X to F.A. But there, this FA that we would be putting down here, that wouldn't be an arbitrary individual. We only use those in assumptions. So the key thing that we learn from this inference is whatever we work out here, it can't be involving this arbitrary individual. So let's formulate that as a general rule for existential elimination. Starting off with an existential involving a sentence A with a variable X in it, what we do is we make an assumption that C is A, where C is an arbitrary individual. So that means it's not already used in the proof up here. OK, it doesn't appear in any undischarged assumptions up here. We infer B, where B can't mention this arbitrary individual. So C doesn't occur up here, but it also doesn't occur in B. If we can do that, then we can infer B directly from this. OK, so we can close that assumption and infer B. So there we have the four rules that we're going to need for the quantifiers in natural deduction proofs. In the next video, I'm going to take you through how we use those by showing you loads and loads of examples. OK, that is all for today. If you have any questions on this, why not leave me a comment below? Thank you for all your support. I really appreciate it. I'll see you back next time. Mm -hmm.